Let me talk about exons and introns. This is otherwise known as mRNA processing. And that's in eukaryotes only. Bacteria don't do this. So what we talked about in general is you go DNA to RNA to protein. Well, this one, it's DNA to RNA. You mess around with the RNA, and you go to protein. So let me show you. There's an intermediate step. And people oftentimes get goofed up by this because it isn't at all clear why it should be there. And I want to say a little bit about that at the end. Transcription produces what we call a pre-mRNA. And you would have seen that on Gene Explorer. And it had some strangely colored pieces that I want to now sort of illustrate here. So your pre-mRNA has a five prime end and it would extend to a three prime end. And let's just say it has A, B, C, D, E, F. All right. So those aren't DNA sequences clearly because B is not a nucleotide. They're like regions of the gene. So this bunch of bases. Rather than writing out a sequence which would be difficult to, to, to copy down, I just use a familiar string of letters to indicate those various parts. And what you might have in this RNA is it would be organized into exons. So exon 1 are typically drawn as blocks and intervening sequences intron 1. And then you might have another exon 2 and then an intron number 2 and then an exon number 3. Right. And there's a couple things. How are these, how do these um, boxes know their boxes and not? Is that there are signal sequences at the beginning of each intron. And so these are start intron signal sequence. Right, and there's one of them here. And then there's also going to be, um, draw it a slightly different symbol, a red square at the end of each intron, an end intron signal sequence. Right there. All right. And the idea is, so there's two of these. Oops, colors right. Each intron has a start and an end. Right. And so just like every other process we've talked about, there's some machine that reads a sequence. And that machine needs a start signal and a stop signal. So promoters has RNA, RNA polymerase looks for promoters and terminators. Ribosomes looks for start codons and stop codons. Splicing machinery looks for start intron sequences and end intron sequences. They don't have fancy names, just start and end. So it's a particular sequence of RNA nucleotide that says start an intron here, and keep splicing it out until you get to this point, and then stop splicing. And let me show you what the splicing, uh, what, what, what that means in the next drawing. So um, two splicing is based on signal sequences and Intron, let me write this really neatly because this is important. Introns are removed. They are depolymerized. And they are recycled. Okay. Break them down to nucleotides and use them over. Exons are kept and joined. All right. And the terminology for this is just plain awkward. It's another one of those things, right? You might think intron means they stay in. Uh -uh. So that's the thing you want to try to erase from your brain. The idea is introns are intervening sequences. There's stuff in the middle you throw away. Exons are expressed. Right? That's just the way the terms got um, invented. So introns are intervening sequences. So those sequences in between that we throw away. 
and the exons are expressed, they are kept. And so what do I mean by that? The, the, after splicing is done, the exons are joined like this so that the regions A, B, and C are present, G, H, and I are present, and M and N are present. Here's a five prime end and a three prime end. And these things here, these are a seamless joint. That is, they can even break in the middle of a codon. So let me say, to sort of reiterate, so sequences D, E, and F, and J, K, and L, gone, removed, snipped out, depolymerized down to nucleotides and recycled, right? Um, and the other parts are joined seamlessly. So if you looked at this RNA, there would be no way to know that something had been snipped out there. Like if you look in GeneX, it's just RNA. There's no way to know that there had been an intron there. It's all been removed, right? And again, it can break in the middle of a codon. So um, this is this weird thing, right? When I, when we're first, when I first learned about it, it was just a fact, and it was what they sort of called junk DNA. It's like, why bother transcribing that huge long RNA and throwing it away? And it turns out in some cases, in many human genes, you throw away up to 90% of the RNA. You go to the total, making this humongous RNA, 90% gets thrown away, 10% gets kept, and then goes on for translation. Why would you do that? At the time, when we first discovered this, it was not at all clear. It's still not entirely clear. It turns out, however, it's beyond the scope of Bio-111, but sometimes a single gene can make more than one protein by controlling which exons get kept and which get skipped. Like sometimes they'll skip exon two. So you're missing some codons, the proton protein's different. It turns out that's an economical way to have one gene make several proteins. Um, it just happens to be so. So in things other than bacteria, so uh, humans, plants, animals, all that sort of stuff, we have this bizarro thing where the introns are removed and the exons are kept. And again, it's done by its particular signal sequence. Questions about that odd thing before we talk about a little bit what happens so there's a few more steps. So when you look at GeneX, you would have seen the results of this if you go back and play with it again, especially for the, for the warm-up. All right, let me say there's a little bit more to say about processing because the other note details you might notice if you look at RNAs in gene X is that there's the final round of processing. There's a cap at the five prime end and a, a tail at the three prime end are added. So you've got your um, RNA, your, your ABC, your GHI, and your MN. And there's a cap, a special nucleotide added at the five prime end, and then a string of A's to the three prime end. That's his tail, or added. And this is now the mature mRNA. And here it's not, again, not clear why these exist. It is likely that the cap and the tail are added last, and so signal this thing is done being spliced. It's okay to translate. There are like markers that say, processing's done, you can go ahead and translate it, because the next steps are, number four is the mature mRNA is exported from the nucleus And then number five, the mature mRNA is translated by ribosomes in the cytoplasm. And so the thing is, if you think about it, the start codons probably in, in the beginning and the stop codons near the end. If you tried to translate a, a not completely spliced RNA, you'd start translating through the introns, which is all these weird junk codons, not something you, stuff that you don't want to translate. So the, the poly A tail and the cap on the end are added when splicing is done to signal, okay, splicing's done. It's okay to ship this out of the nucleus. It's good to go. It's good to be translated. 
So there is this odd artifact of, that's true of, of human and eukaryotic genes. It's not a bacteria. It is. People are coming to understand more about why, but mostly it just is. Questions? All right, let me just, I want to make a small summary here. As I said, all these processes have control sequences. So the process control sequence make a little table here. And then is it the same in all organisms? So transcription is controlled by promoters and terminators. And these are, no, these are not the same in all organisms. That is, a promoter sequence in, in a bacterium would not work for the RNA polymerase in, in, in our cells and vice versa. Splicing is controlled by start and stop intron sequences. These are also not the same in all organisms. Translation is by start and stop codons, and they are the same. Yes. Okay. That is, start and stop codons, the genetic code, it turns out, and the genetic code is universal. There are some very small exceptions. The cool thing about genetic code is CCC encodes proline in every living thing on Earth, which is why recombinant D DNA works, that you can take a gene from a human and put it in a bacterium, and it will make the same protein because the codons are exactly the same. Promoters and all that other stuff won't work, but the fundamental coding region part will work. So that's one point from all this. The other point about this is all of these machines are independent of one another. RNA polymerase knows promoters and terminators. It doesn't know anything about codons, doesn't know anything about splicing. It says, I see a promoter, I will make an RNA until I see a terminator. I don't care what's in between. It minds its own business. Splicing things, they look in RNAs for start and, and intron sequences and they splice them. They don't know anything about codons, anything else down the line, they just do their, they mind their business, they splice things. Likewise, the ribosome, it finds a start codon, it rolls along until it makes a stop codon. It doesn't care whether that protein's good, bad, or indifferent. It just minds its own business and follows the instructions that it's given. Questions about those? Yeah. Tell me what you mean, do they all work at the same time? There is a kind of a sequence that is transcription happens first, then splicing, then translation. That's certainly true. Yeah, yeah. All right. What I want to do now 